it okay with your name? Uh -huh. <laughs> okay, um, I'd like to take the, thank the DCGA and the organization for uh, giving me the pleasure of, um, of presenting the results that we've been um, collecting with Mike Lawrence um, on the pan cancer data that's being analyzed by the DCGA right now. So many of you have probably seen this slide and it just goes to the basic notion of how genome and exome data is analyzed in many of these sequencing projects. So um, the tumor and the match normal extracted from a patient and, um, and they're compared against each other to come up with the, to characterize the most important uh, somatic genetic alterations that we tend to look at nowadays, which is a single nucleotide variance, um, uh, indels, um, copy number alterations, translocations, et cetera. And then when we combine these, we get cohorts of, of, of patients either in the same tumor type or now, as you, as you will see, across tumor types to look at, um, to, to, look, to, look at to, do perform, uh, to perform statistically uh, statistical analysis to see which genes are, um, which, which events are most recurrent, significantly recurrent in the population, and then see what are these genes, what are the pathways, and what is the selection that they provide to tumor genesis? So um, this is a little, a little bit of overview of the data that has been uh, collected due to today, and us, the TCGA, have contributed to a large portion of it. And as you can see, we cover about 20 to 25 tumor types, with about 500 tumor normal pairs for each. And, um, and you can see that we have many types of data for each. We have whole exome sequencing, we have whole genome sequences, RNA-seq, SNP arrays, and methylation data. And as you can see, the ICGC is also contributing for a huge amount to up to 50 different tumor types with 500 tumor normal pairs for each. Um, so this, in a nutshell, says that there is a huge amount of data, and this is a flood that we have to handle, and we have to take advantage of the power that it gives us and also we have to uh, uh, deal with the complexity that it actually represents when we add so much data together. And um, the way this data is processed, and this is, uh, this, um, this, is to over, uh, this is something that Mike Noble will go over uh, in, his, in his talk. So, um, so basically, going from sequencing data to a BAM file, which is the line data against the reference genome, and then going through quality control and then going through the characterization pipelines and they're all in fire hose at the broad and they detect all of the, of the genetic alterations that we try to look for, which is mutations, indels, characterizing purity and purity of samples, copy number, rearrangements and pathogens in tumor data. So to, this is the overview of the pan cancer data set. So we have eight different tumor types. So it's breast, colon, glioblastoma, kidney, lung squamous, ovarian, rectal, and endometrial to a total of 2,143 patients. And also that amounts to 436,755 mutations, coding mutations. So that's an extremely large amount of data and, um, and it's, it's, we can see here the spread of, of the different mutation frequencies across tumor types. So um, we can see that they can vary and, they, and, and that the lung has a significantly higher mutation frequency than the rest of the tumor types. And we can see that within tumor type, we have variable mutation frequency. Um, also, we can see the different um, mutation categories on the bottom panel. And uh, the C2A changes are the ones that are uh, prevalent in lungs squamous, and those are the, ho the, the, the typical signature for, for smoking. And also we can see that C to T uh, transitions are, are prevalent across all tumor types, and those are largely the C to G uh, context mutations, which are contributing to the high amount of the background mutation rate. So um, in order to deal with the 400,000, approximately 400,000 mutations and figure out what are the recurrent genes, um, we have been working on the pipeline music for several years now, and uh, at, at this point in time, this, this, uh, this, this algorithm takes into account multiple factors. So it calculates sample-specific, gene-specific, and context-specific background mutation rate. So this is for each gene. We try to estimate the background model, just based on the number of mutations that are there. And so then we look at the base-level evolutionary conservation of the events, we look at the positional configuration along the cDNA to see where, where are the, the mutations located and are there particular hotspots that they, they cluster in. And we also have a separate metric for truncating mutations. 
So this is an overview below of, the, of all the different tumor types that we analyzed, and we see that the number of significant genes varies from a couple of dozen to uh, only, a few tumor, uh, uh, only a few significant genes, and we see that in pan cancer, we actually detect a lot more. Um, and we'll go into the details one by one, so I'll present, um, I'll, I'll present all of these published studies one by one in the chronological order in which they were published. We can go over some of the genes that, uh, that we find, and then we'll see how that actually is represented once we combine all these data sets together. So this is, uh, this is glioblastoma, and this, this was published a long time ago already, 2008, and it was um, and, and we can see that, we, that here we find most of the genes that were published at the time that are, uh, that are characteristic for GBM, like EGFR mutations, P10 mutations, RB1 mutations, PIK3R1 mutations, and then soon after this paper was published, also IDH1 was published. And, and um, we see that, that the mutations here are clustered in, in two, uh, two hotspots um, in two sites, and there's 15 of them. So I'm going to go over what the columns mean of this table. So basically, uh, in this table we have a list of genes, we have a number of mutations, number of patients, number of sites, and then we have the different p-values that the algorithm outputs. So we have the background model p-value, we have the clustering p-value, we have the p-value for conservation, and then we have a p-value after we combine all of these different metrics together. So, so this is for glioblastoma, and then we see that IDH1 is uh, up on the list, and we have GABRA1, and Integrin Alpha might be also interesting because it's clustered and also well-conserved. Um, and so also for, for Varian, we see the, the basic highlight that most patients have, a, have P53 mutations, and also by performing clustering and conservation analysis, we managed to pull up SARC, which is, which is four, uh, albeit on, on low recurrence, there is uh, only four, four mutations and four patients, but they're in two sites uh, that are well clustered and well conserved. So for colon, we have, uh, as you've seen in the published data, we have the, the, two, the two major pathways, the WIND pathway and the TGF beta receptor pathway. Uh, we have FBXW7, we have APC, we have FAM123B, and then for TGF beta receptor, we have SMAT2, we have TGF BR2, we have SMAT4. Then we also have some PIK3CA mutations. We have BRAF mutations, V600E, that also cluster, and they're very well conserved, as you can see here. So, so we, we managed to get most of the genes that were published um, in, in, in an order on the top of the list. It's a similar, so the same two pathways are implicated in, in, in rectal tumor as well, as you can see here. For lung squamous, we also managed to get the, a, a lot of the genes that were, that were published in the manuscript, and the most important, one of the most important ones are NFL202 and KEEP1, which are binding partners. Then we have NOTCH1, loss of function mutations that are, um, that are similar to the uh, head and neck uh, paper that also came out with the similar type of mutations. We have RB1, we have MLL2, so as you can see, we're, we're getting the same mutations that, that were published. And these are important pathways, and they're important to their respective tumor types. For breast, we also get all the genes that were, that, and even though we lose, in this case we use different algorithms, we get largely the same genes that were published. So we get uh, the genes from every different, uh, each, each subtype of breast cancer, luminal A, luminal B, basal, et cetera. So we get GATA1, RUNX1, we get uh, AKT1, we get MLL3, we get P10. Um, and also, uh, we also, very interestingly, we get SF3B1, which was published um, in a chronic lymphocytic leukemia paper in New England, and also um, uh, it was also implicated in MDS. And it's a splicing factor that it's still being largely researched to see what the target that it's misplicing is. So um, for kidney cancer, we have the two uh, important genes that were just talked about in the previous talk, PBRM1, VHL. Uh, and BAP1, um, and, and so, so here we have a, a, a much lower recurrence of P53, um, and also there is an interesting gene here, DNH9, which is clustered and conserved with 20 mutated sites. So with endometrial, the most interesting genes here, apart from the ones that, that are in the, in the known pathways that we know about, our NFE2L2, which is implicated in, 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 uh, in lung cancer, and also we have SPOP, which is important in prostate cancer. 
And NFV202 is also clustered and conserved the same way it is in lung squamous, but we don't see its binding partner here, so it would be interesting to investigate exactly how this pathway functions in endometrial tumors. So now, after putting all of these data sets together, we have a lot more power to detect genes that are not significant in any of their respective tumor types um, because there is not enough power to detect them in them. But now once we combine everything together, we'll see that apart from the genes that we get that are significant and their hallmark genes for each separate tumor type, we, as we go down the list, we see genes that we can only detect by combining tum uh, tumor types. So, so here on the top of the list, this is, this is 150 genes, so there is five parts of this table. And um, the top part shows the, all the genes that I just went over, and they're all from the, from, the, from the different tumor types that we described, and they're all hallmarks of each respective tumor type, up until we start getting to this part of the list where we have MTM1 and HCN1, which are new, and, um, and, um, and, then, we, and then we have NFE2L2, and then we go forward to see another family member of, of hyperpolarization activate cyclic nucleotide <laughs> receptor, um, and then we have uh, beta-2 microglobulins. So we have um, uh, a lot of genes that, that we wouldn't be able to find um, if, if we were doing all of these tumor types separately. Also, ATM is a famous, it's a, it's a famous tumor suppressant gene. It was found to be significant in, in CLL in the New England Journal paper where the SF3B1 was found as well. But we didn't find it as significant in any of these um, tumor, tumor types that we analyzed. Um, and also ERB2 is, is significant and, and other genes as well on this list. So, and here we have uh, different transcription factors like E2F1, which is uh, very cl well clustered and well uh, conserved. And we have uh, also TCF7 and STK3, which is a serine threonine kinase, which is not very recurrent in the set, but it's uh, really, really well clustered and well conserved. So here, is a, here, here, here are the genes represented as a percent, uh, the maximum number of percent, percent mutated for, for their respective tumor types. So we can see in this, in this table that, um, that, that the genes, the order in the way that they were, uh, so, so we see most genes that we found significant by analyzing the tumor types separately. So we have TP53, APC, P10, KRAS, pic 3 ca so we have all of the genes that we've talked about in all the papers that we published so far. And this, this, this represents, summarizes the, the recurrence of the results when we analyze all the tumor types separately. And so when we combine the data sets together, we get a table where, there's, where, where they're sorted by percent recurrence in the overall data set, the pan cancer data set. And so here we, we, we see the same genes up on top that we get in all the papers, but now we get genes that we think they're significant in one tumor type, but they're also mutated in every other tumor type. And that's DNA, uh, DNA H9, we, had fat, we have FAT4, we have uh, MLL2, and, um, and then we have, um, we have certain genes that we have to see if they're real or not, like EYS, and, uh, and so on. NFE2L2 is only in lung, but so, so, so to summarize these results, as I said, we have a different number of significant genes per tumor type, and we have a lot of significant genes on the pan cancer data set. And, um, and, and we have a lot of new genes that come up, and, and I only talked about a few of them, but you see that there is a big list. And, and here are some of them that I just mentioned that are family members um, that might be important. And then we have beta-2 microglobulin, which is a, uh, an immune, uh, Im immune pathway, an antigen uh, marking pathway. And then we have MTM1, which is a muscle cell differentiation molecule. And we know that, that differentiation uh, is, is an important um, mechanism in cancer, but there are still genes that are a part of it that we haven't found yet. And, um, and so, so to, to conclude, I think that when combining tumor, 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 uh, tumor types together, there's two things that we have to keep in mind. Com combining tumor types give us the significantly more power to detect putative driver genes that we are underpowered to detect in each tumor type separately. And on the, on the flip side, it also dilutes the power to detect driver genes that are potentially important in the respective tumor types. So genes that are found on the bottom of the significance table that are barely recurrent enough to actually be noticed by, by the analysis team 
in the respective tumor type will not make it in the, in the final list uh, once, we, once we combine all the data sets together. But here are some future steps that we need to consider when we combine data sets, because this is a pretty complex problem. Um, so there's a couple of things we can do. We can incorporate other information for potential functional role apart from con conservation. So there is polyphen 2, there is mutation assessor, and there is chasm, and Rachel Karchin will be talking about those things in the next talk. Um, and then uh, we, have, we, can, we can perform the significance analysis on curated gene sets, which we have done before for different tumor types. And then we can extend this analysis to look at correlation and mutual exclusivity with MIMO uh, within and across tumor types, and we can take into account the variable uh, background mutation frequency across the genome. And by taking the variable mutation rate across the genome, we can also look at pathways uh, by performing significance analysis on altered gene subnetworks by working with HotNet um, and, and Paradigm as well. So it's important to collaborate with these groups together and also the other thing that's really important is, is as, as the previous speaker mentioned, is that integrated analysis has not been done yet, especially on these, on, on these huge, gene, uh, huge, huge data sets where we get genes that are, that are new and that are not significant in the respective tumor types. So with that, I would like to uh, conclude and, and thank, uh, first of all, Gaddy Getz, who's being spearheading this pan-cancer effort at the Broad, and then uh, Matthew Myers and Stacy Gabriel, Levi, Levi, Eric, Linda, and Todd, who are you know, the leaders at the Broad who help a lot with this analysis and, and bringing about these ideas. And also, I'd like to thank our analysis team and our collaborators. Thank you. So how often, uh, two related questions, how often do these look like gain of function versus loss of function, these, these rare ones that you're pulling out? Do you see, second sort of corollary, do you see particular point mutations at particular amino acids showing up in, in multiple cancers very infrequently, or these are more often very loss of function in many different ways? So for, for certain genes that we found in the in, in the last table that I showed, um, we, have, we haven't investigated if there are really loss of function, but we have both cases. For DNA H9, for example, we have hotspots, and for beta-2 microglobulin, we have to see if, if, if there are loss of function or not. But we haven't really looked at these genes closely yet. They're just, uh, you know, just fresh out of the computer, and we have to go through them. So uh, just two more questions, then we'll have to move on. Hi, um, I'm Angela from Harvard. I have a question on... Uh, since you've done the pan-cancer analysis now, can you comment on which pathway had the most mutated genes um, of, from all the different tumors you've analyzed? And my second question is, um, are you look, gonna look at the promoter regions in your whole genomes to look for uh, significantly altered uh, regions? So for the first question, I think from, from what I've been noticing, and the, the most implicated pathway seems to be, you know, the TGF beta receptor and the, and the wind signaling pathway mutations that are on top of the list. But we also have to look and see if we can place the other genes that we just discussed that are more rare into different pathways. And for the second question, um, I'm not exactly sure how many whole genomes we have to analyze this, but we can use the flanking regions and the coverage in the flanking regions to see if there is any promoter mutations. Yeah, uh, basically, so uh, I'd like to know that uh, if you have the percentage information or mostly for this mutation, are they like uh, site-specific mutations or they, are this most related to the alternative splicing, like related to that? Also, and uh, I'd like to know that uh, what kind of software you use when to identify this kind of mutations. Thank well, you. Excuse me, can you repeat what type of mutations? The first I, one? I, yeah, yeah. So f my first question is asking, and uh, you, you have any information related to these gene mutations? Are they mostly like uh, site-specific uh, mutations, or are they like a uh, big oh, you mean the changes? clustering? Yeah, big changes, like uh, alternative splicing. Um, so, so, the f so the first question is about the cluster mutations, right? Yeah, related to the so, mutations. So we have, so we have a, an add-on to the MUTZIG algorithm that looks at, uh, jointly looks at the conservation and, uh, and the clustering, and then we combine that metric with the, with the p-value that we get for the, for the different covariates that build the background model. And so that way we can pull up genes that are not as recurrent in the data set, but 
are well clustered and have some sort of conserved hotspot that might be important in a pathway. And that, that's how we can get genes like SF3B1 with a canonical site, which is a splicing factor, and then we can get other mutations like a lot of different kinases uh, this way. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Peter. We've got to move on. Okay. And uh, one more speaker.